Welcome to this episode of Audio History, where we cover the seminal Audio Research SP3A preamp. Okay, boys and girls, I'm excited about this one because this product, the Audio Research SP3A preamp, which debuted in the early 1970s, had a real impact on the audio world and one that I think we can learn quite a bit from today. So stay tuned as we go through this because it's not just a trip down memory lane. It gives us some idea of where to look for uh, ways to enjoy the hobby even more, uh, although we're roughly 50 years down the road. Okay, Audio Research was a brand new company in the 1970s, and uh, their obvious difference was that at the time, it was thought, and this had been thought for, I don't know, let's say 10 years, that transistors were replacing tubes as the amplification device of choice. In fact, that idea had gotten so far along that tubes were considered completely backwards, and roughly speaking, there were almost no manufacturers still putting out tube electronics, or certainly not putting out new designs based on tube amplification devices. So Audio Research, a little company in Minneapolis, comes along and starts making both power amplifiers and preamplifiers using tubes as the amplification device. Okay, that's nice. It's kind of theoretical. Uh, I do think it helped them get some attention, but what really got them attention was as audiophiles started to sit down in hi-fi stores and listen to what the audio research products could do, and I'm going to say especially the SP3A, what it could do when it was part of the hi-fi setup. It had an impact. It left a mark on your brain. It made a note in your soul somewhere. Uh, it said, this is something different. And what I think in particular it said is, it is possible to get significantly closer to the absolute sound, the sound of live music in a real space. It is possible to get significantly closer to that than we previously thought. I didn't really know what I was missing. Uh, I have here in front of me the Absolute Sounds Illustrated History of High-End Audio and there are some excellent details of audio research but in particular Jonathan Vallon who wrote the section on uh, William Z. Johnson and who was the founder of audio research and some of the early audio research products uh, Valen tells a story in there about learning about the uh, audio research electronics that kind of parallels mine and honestly was probably happening at about the same time. Uh, I'll tell my story because uh, it's the one I know the best. You can read JV's account in the book. Uh, but uh, I was going to school on the East Coast and Chris Martins, another uh, editor, uh, and I traveled to Buffalo, New York to a hi-fi store there named Transcendental Audio. And we walked in, and we really just wanted to hear what was new, see new stuff. I don't know, maybe we went there to hear something specifically, but uh, it was kind of a you know typical audio pilgrimage for 20-somethings to make. And uh, the salesperson 
said, well, why don't you listen to this? I think you'll find this to be really interesting. And he played a uh, system, and I don't remember the amplifier or the speakers or the turntable or the cartridge, but I absolutely remember that he used an Audio Research SP3 preamp. And we remember because he pulled it out of the circuit and put another conventional solid state preamp in the circuit, and the difference was truthfully at that time unbelievable i didn't think preamps could make that kind of a difference uh it just wasn't in my head it wasn't that i really walked in with the idea that preamps couldn't do that i just had never had that experience so what did the sp3a do well what it managed to combine which i want to say i think a lot of electronics manufacturers have searched for kind of ever after is an incredible balance of clarity with a sense of hearing into the sound stage, but without brightness or artifacts that made it seem like an obviously manufactured, fake kind of clarity. It just seemed to open up the sound stage and open up the air around each instrument so it sounded much more like it was real and there without changing the tonal balance in such a way that you were like, yeah, but that's, that's an artifact. That's fake. It did not sound fake at all. It sounded real. Uh, it was a tremendous experience and one we can have more and more now because products have gotten... Uh, significantly better since then, but it was what I think we could honestly say was a breakthrough. Uh, ironically enough, or interestingly enough, uh, the salesperson who waited on us that day was Dan D'Agostino, later to go on and found Krell, uh, another pioneering company that built electronics that changed the game, and now uh, in charge, Dan is in charge of D'Agostino Master Audio Systems. So Dan uh, turned out to be a designer and executive of some repute, and I think uh, he knew what he was listening to, and I think this helped set him on the path to trying to make groundbreaking electronics that could really change the game. So the uh, SP3A uh, sounded different in a way that you could hear pretty much instantaneously if you were really listening. And Chris and I both agreed it was uh, a game changer at the time. Dan thought it was a game changer. Bob Minnick, who owned Transcendental Audio, thought it was a game changer. So there was general agreement that we were hearing something that was truly special and different. And you could put your finger on uh, what those differences were, and you could understand that they were uh, a step, a significant step forward in the quest for greater realism. What's also nice, and a third thing that I think benefited the audio community, is that audio research kind of upset the expectations of the audio world on assumptions that we know a lot about what technology does. I can't explain to you how much uh, tubes were thought of to be the technology of the 1950s and had obviously been passed by and were obviously inferior and were obviously wrong. Uh, and when the apple cart gets upset that dramatically because you can hear the result and go, oh, those are tubes, and you can hear the result of using transistor circuits back in the day, the devices weren't nearly as far along as they are today. But back then, it just upset your expectations, and I think that was a healthy move for high-end audio as well because it taught some of us that yeah, we could study and listen and try to figure out what was causing what, but there was just at least as much that we didn't know as there was that we did know about what made for 
good sound, realistic sound, the recreation of the absolute sound. Uh, and that healthy uh, uncertainty about what works creates an openness to trying new things. And that openness to trying new things is part of how the state of the art advances. So uh, I think audio research really gave us a gift in the SP3A. And uh, if you get to hear it, or frankly, modern audio research electronics, I think you can uh, hear some of what I'm talking about. Although, uh, honestly, the solid state designers have kept up, or in some cases more than kept up with the game. And that competition is also a healthy thing in moving the state of the art forward. So there we have it, the Audio Research SP3A, a product that can teach us a lot about what we really should be adopting as a philosophy of learning in our quest to build our own systems to be as good as they can be. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we enjoyed making it. Uh, it's fun for us to take a trip down memory lane, believe me. And uh, we would just ask that you uh, subscribe, uh, hit the notify button if you would. It helps us out. It also helps you out because uh, you get more of our videos in your feed and you can be notified when we make new ones, which is a couple times a week. So thanks for visiting, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.